Hey, Jill Mathis here with another web course from Photography Concentrate. Today we're going to be talking about making black and white photos. But more than that, we're going to be talking about how to make the smart choices the right way when you're trying to decide whether to go monochrome or stay with your polychrome photo. When I started to have a look at all that's being said on the internet about choosing when to turn your color photo into a black and white photo, I found a sea of all sorts of lists and advice and tips. I saw things like, it gives your work credibility. Or I saw things like, it helps you cover mistakes in lighting. Well, I'm going to say these types of comments made me cringe just a little bit since they are so very superficial. An ill-composed, badly lit color photo is not going to get any better if it's in black and white. And as far as being credible, the only way you're going to convince friends and family and clients that you are a good photographer is simply by being conscientious in how you take photos. The main narrative in all this chatter was create a black and white photo when color distracted from the subject or the message or the story you were trying to tell. Now, that bothered me a bit too, but I guess I could sort of see where the premise of this was coming from. The other thing I saw a lot was that it, it's more artistic. Now, that bothered me a bit more. So we're going to talk first about some of those rather misleading pieces of advice. I learned a lot about black and white photography by being the assistant for many years to a photographer made famous for his particular style in photography in general, but black and white specifically. I'm talking about Ralph Gibson. Another thing is my formative years were in the day before digital, so that of course influences me greatly in this digital age we find ourselves in. But I find that all that I learned then is still applicable now. In those days, you had to make the conscious decision before you even stepped out the door to put a roll of black and white film in your camera. Now, on a side note, my go-to film was the 320 ASA of Professional Tri-X, which, by the way, is what I set my digital cameras to now. And like that, you basically learn to see, to visualize in black and white. There was no change in it in post-production unless you wanted to get out the photo tints. From this in particular, I have come to realize that with digital, one of the most important things is getting into the habit of seeing in black and white before you even snap the shutter. In one of my past videos, I talk about breaking down composition into geometric shapes to find the harmony and balance needed to make a compositionally strong image. We talk about simplifying what you see in front of you into, into squares and triangles and circles so you learn to make lightning fast adjustments to your camera angle, your eye level, your distance while you're shooting. Now shooting like this also helps you to minimize the unnecessary or superfluous in a scene. You see what fits and what doesn't. The same premise can be applied to making black and white images. I believe you'll have far more success if you start to see the photo in black and white before you see it in color on your computer screen. Now, this takes some time to get into the habit of doing, so it's important to go slow. If you are truly interested in making an educated decision instead of just trying to guess at which works better for a photo, my suggestion is that the next time you see something that inspires you enough to take a photo of, Stop for a second and try and visualize it in black and white before you snap the shutter. Or better yet, give yourself an assignment and decide to do some portraits or some still life photos with the sole intention of making black and white photos. Even go so far as to pretend that your digital camera is actually a film camera so you can't switch back and forth. Don't just say to yourself, I'll see what this looks like when I get back in front of the computer. See if you can imagine it in the moment, because all that you are seeing outside of your camera frame, all that you're feeling in that moment, the wind, the sun, your emotions and thoughts going through your head will influence how you photograph. All those factors aren't there when you get back home or back in your studio. 
While a photo is inarguably two-dimensional, a good photo is multifaceted and made up of many, many aspects combining your mood, your personality, and your experience. To sort of help you get used to black and white in the moment, a lot of cameras have the possibility to change the monochrome in the settings. While that can be interesting to see in the beginning, it really is more of a crutch that I don't really highly recommend. It's better, far better, to train your eye and mind to visualize the scene in black and white, especially since we are lucky enough to have the technology these days to shoot both in camera. So let's talk about this reality for a minute. Let's talk about what's really going on when photographing in black and white. What we know as reality, our reality as we're living it and seeing it right now, is made up of three things. One is scale, which in real life is 100%, which simply means that what you have in front of you is, well, what you get. That person in front of you is at scale. That house or mountain you're looking at is at actual scale. Now, the second thing is, is three-dimensionality. Again, that person in front of you isn't flat, nor is that skyscraper or a blade of grass. And thirdly, even if you are in a snowstorm in the Arctic, your reality is made of color. So when you take a color photo, you alter reality by changing two of those three fundamental elements. You reduce the scale. That house that you just photographed is scaled down to an 8x10 sheet of paper or your 27-inch computer screen. And you go from a three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional one. Well, you take one more step away from reality when you take a black and white photo. You alter reality by changing all three of those fundamental elements. Edward Steichen, who we touched on in part one of my Studying the Masters series, says this about photography. Photography is difficult because while the artist working in any other medium begins with a blank surface and gradually brings his conception into being, the photographer is the only image maker who begins with a picture completed. His emotions, his knowledge, and his native talent are brought into focus and fixed beyond recall the moment the shutter of his camera is closed. So one question you can start asking yourself to help you make the choices. That completed picture I see in front of me, do I want to keep as close to reality as possible? Are the colors fundamental to what I'm feeling here? Or am I reacting to the subject matter, the arrangement of elements, the dialogue between shadows and light? How far away from reality do I want to get? There are some die-hard monochromists out there. Leica users, which I'm guilty of being, often fall into that rather uncompromising category and tend to be very pretentious claiming that color is overly crass and unnecessary. Leica actually makes a monochrome digital camera with the tagline, free yourself from color. I feel that is just an incredibly limiting way to look at photography and the world in general. The two things are simply different, as different as apples and oranges, which is why it's important to make the decision in camera as you're photographing rather than wait and let outside influences dictate your choice. I've seen this phrase often. It's important to shoot not just in black and white, but shoot because of it. For me, there is no one subject or, or one type of light that lends itself to being photographed solely in black and white. For me, when I'm working on my own particular series, everything is in black and white, but it's because I've trained my eye to see that way. Granted, a close-up of a flower probably calls for color, but not necessarily a field of flowers in my way of thinking. But we have to start somewhere to lead our minds into thinking and seeing a certain way. So to look at things from another angle, especially if the earlier breakdown of reality was, well, too surreal, and you're thinking, you know, I just want to go out and try my hand at black and white, Let's look at it like this. As I mentioned earlier, my video on composition breaks composition down into geometric shapes 
to find the harmony and balance needed to make a compositionally strong image. If you start to see in black and white, you'll see that it, it is an excellent tool if you want to show form and shape and tonal contrast. In the beginning, to ease yourself into it, start looking for patterns and textures and lines and shapes regardless of their color, much like you do as you're setting up your composition. Which reminds me of a running joke Ralph Gibson had. Now, I'm paraphrasing this drastically, but when asked if he preferred black and white to color, he would reply he shot in all three. In any case, shooting a black and white photo needs to be a decision just like deciding your speed and your f-stop, just like deciding to bend down or stand up on something or to move in or to move back. Be accountable for each photograph you take. Now, inversely, if you, if you know that what caught your attention first and foremost was the color or colors in the scene, such as in photos of India's color festival, then go in feet first and embrace and capture that color. But strong colors like these don't need to be the only mitigating factors for making the decision to shoot in color. Color can be a tangible element, or it can also be intangible. Intangibly, your subject that you're photographing can be enhanced by the feeling created by the actual color. I read once that while black and white turned the mundane artistic, the early color photos shot with Kodachrome were successful because they were mundane. They were usually muted colors of everyday life. I mean, just think about it. A lot of cameras and cell phones have a Kodachrome filter to recreate that particular look. What I'm trying to convey here is, again, think about the why behind your decision for each photo. Why do I want to do black and white? Or why would it be better in color? Or all three, even. The history behind early color photography is really pretty interesting. When it was introduced back in the 30s with the invention of Kodachrome, it was rejected by almost all professional photographers. There was a need to learn a real technique and a talent and a mystery behind black and white that came from doing it all yourself, from taking the photo to developing the negative to printing the print. Color photography was originally embraced solely by amateur hobbyists since the film was developed relatively fast in a lab and corresponded pretty much with the advent and popularity of portable cameras and rolls of film instead of large format heavy cameras that needed glass plates for each negative. A certain level of technique was lost and replaced though by the want and the thrill of capturing whatever popped in front of your camera. Needless to say, that lack of a principal skill in photography, I'm talking about the developing stage, helped black and white to retain its more highbrow stature. To be honest, I've often thought that most people would benefit if they began photographing in black and white when they first started, before anything else, since it really does train your eye to look for composition and contrast more. But more than that, if you're seeing the scene in black and white, that means that there is one less element that you need to work with, which helps you concentrate on the basics, which is particularly helpful when you're first starting out. Now, those of you who work with me in the Facebook members group have probably seen me write that while I use Lightroom and Photoshop extensively, I am far from an expert. I realized a long time ago that I needed to spend far more time learning the frequent upgrades than I really wanted to. Ten years ago, I began using a professional printing lab that changed the way I do things completely. I'll never get to the point, nor do I want to, of the folks whose work it is to spend eight hours a day in front of Photoshop. But I do my initial adjustments to get an idea of how I want to see an image. More contrast maybe, lighten the shadows, do some vignetting, etc. And then I take in the file and work with the printer who's been doing my large scale images for over 10 years now. She takes them to the next level in about five minutes where it would have taken me probably hours. I highly recommend this approach, especially if you intend to start exhibiting. In any case, I thought I'd show, mainly for the Lightroom or Photoshop beginners, some of the things that I do to help you get started. 
There's so much great information out there on the web, but I found one site, slrlounge.com, that had a format to their videos where each video is sort of bite-sized. That way, you can learn as you go along or check in when needed. Besides videos on black and white conversion, they have basic videos such as explaining at what quality your JPEG should be when you export to a little more detailed ones on things like using the tone curve or using graduated filters. So definitely have a look at what they have to offer. And of course, your own Photography Concentrate has a rich library of tutorials in the blog on just about everything. So you should be set to start making black and white masterpieces. I thought we'd start with a photo from an exhibition I did a while back, and I'll show you what was done to get from a raw image to a museum wall. So we're going to go ahead and take this photo. It's uh, the same one that you saw in the exhibition. We're going to take this photo, and this is the original image, and convert it to black and white. Now, a while back, what I used to do is I would just desaturate, which would give me a black and white image. But then I read that if I do that, I lose a lot of the effects that Lightroom has for black and white images. So now I do as they suggest, and I go up here and just hit black and white. Very easy. So as with the color photo, I noticed right away in the color photo, but I see it especially here, and is that there is a lot of white. There's a lot of light color up here. It's almost as white as the sky. And also there is, a, it's just too dark down here. And for this particular image, I actually, my focus for the work that I'm, the etymology work that I do, it's all about the heels. So this is a really important part of the photo for me. So I'm gonna to have to lighten this area up and bring this down just a bit. Now, one of the things I do often is I go ahead and hit the uh, L on the keyboard so that I can really focus on the image. This helps a lot to get rid of all the uh, tools and so forth that are in Lightroom and or Photoshop, if you're in that, uh, and really look at the image clearly. So that just confirms some of the things that I just mentioned, so I'll bring it back here. So one of the very first things I want to do is go on down to the highlights and the lights and the darks and the shadows. So this is the area that I want to bring up. So I'm going to go ahead and just bring this up a little bit. And you can see how, I'm going to bring it up quite a bit actually. See how that really opens up. Again, I'm going to take this photo and put it in Photoshop after I get it to a certain point. So let's go ahead now and bring this down, this area down a little bit. I'm not going to bring it down too much because I'm going to, there's an, I, I, if you notice in the original photo, you see there's a lot of oranges and, and reds and yellows. I'm going to use the other, I'm going to use the, the, um, the color panel to do most of the work I'm going to do, but I'm going to go ahead and bring this down just a little bit, bring down the lights just a tad. And even when I was working in the darkroom and all my prints came from the darkroom, I always made sure um, I had developed a style that was, that was rather contrasty and probably greatly influenced by Ralph Gibson. But um, so my, my paper, the papers that I used and the filters I used always rendered my images very contrasty. So I have kept that style even now in digital. So I'm going to go ahead and um, bring up, you know, make it a little bit more contrasty. Um, that's just, that's just the way I have developed over all these years. And so I want to keep that even though I'm doing digital. And I also, since I've kind of lost some of the blacks here a bit when I lighten the shadows, I'm going to just bring the blacks up all around because for me, it's important to, um, to have these blacks down here in the, in the, in the, in the, in the floor of the boat. So that is already looking a little, a little bit better. Another thing that I like to do besides, besides uh, getting rid of um, the side panels is I like to click on the soft proofing. Since my work 
is mainly, and I go ahead, then I hit the L again, and I'm able to see what my work is going to look like on a white wall, which is pretty much where all my work ends up. So it's looking a little gray. It's looking a little flat. I'm going to go back to the gray. So I'm going to have to work on that a little bit. But in the meantime, let's go back down to the color panel. And um, again, like I said, see here in the original photo, there's a lot of reds and oranges and yellows. So I'm going to, I saw that in the original, so I'm going to bring those down a little bit so I can get some definition going in her legs and also darken that light, that lighter spot up there where the sun is. And since that lighter spot, see how this is a lot of yellow here, since that lighter spot is yellow, if I lower the yellow, oops, back there if I lower the yellow part that really brings that re that really brings the the bright area down quite a bit so let's have a look at what that looks like in soft proofing and see the legs are now coming out a little bit more before it was a lot it was a lot flatter so I am I'm liking this I'm going to go ahead and leave it in soft pro proofing for now I like this I think we're getting pretty close might uh, might open these shadows up just a tad, but again, I'm going to bring this, I'm going to, oh right, I forgot about that, undo, got to get that out of the soft proofing, otherwise that won't let you, won't let you work in your, your panels. I'm going to bring that up just a tad more, and bring up the contrast just a little bit more. Now, I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more definition to sort of uh, get something going in between the floor of the boat in here. So since we know that those are blues over here from the original photo, I'm gonna go ahead and change those around over here in the blues and the aqua colors. So I'm gonna lower that, see how that just kind of brings, brings a little bit more of the shadow, a little bit more definition in the water. Same over here for there. And back to soft proofing and let's see what it looks like. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm feeling pretty good about this. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and um, open it up in Photoshop. Now I have uh, brought the photo from Lightroom over into Photoshop. And uh, the reason I do that is that I'm, I'm pretty old school. You know, I still, I, I, I learned how to deal with black and white photographs in the darkroom. And so a lot of the same tools that I use in the darkroom, I like to go ahead and keep using over here in Photoshop. And I'm talking about, in particular, the, these two, the, the burn tool and the dodge tool. So let's, uh, let's start with the dodge tool. And I want to, um, I want to, again, lighten up this area a little bit. This is a little bit big, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it down just a bit. I want to lighten up this area again over here because, as I said before, this is, um, this is a really important part. I'm going to go ahead and lower that down a bit more. It's a really important part of the photo for me from a standpoint of, uh, of, the, um, of the title of the, of the work and uh, the subject matter. So that looks pretty good. Lighten that up a little bit. I think I might just lighten it up overall. Maybe get it up to about 800 here, this size. Lighten up overall, just a tad. There you go. So I'm going to go ahead and keep it at that. And now I'm going to go over to the burn tool. And I like a little bit more of a vignetting down here. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of, just kind of darken this, some of these areas up here, just a tad. Now you have to be careful with the burn tool. It's a lot stronger than the than the uh, dodging tool, and 10% um, is already a lot. I'm going to go ahead and bring it down just a tad, and um, so you can really control what you're doing. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and just even that out a little bit there, and I feel a little bit more. Uh, I feel better about that. I just didn't didn't want to do a vignetting around up here, but I did want a little bit more information. Let's even it out here. A little bit more information down here. So I'm also, while we're here with the burn tool, I'm going to go ahead and darken 
this area that still bother me a little bit. I'm going to darken this just a tad. Bring that up so it's um, sort of just evens out this whole area up here. There we go. So now having used the dodge tool down here, I sort of lost some of my contrast. And like I had said before, contrast is, uh, is a bit a part of my style. So I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more contrast. There we go. So I feel pretty good about that now. And uh, let's have a look and just see. I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit smaller. Let's have a look and see what it looked like prior. And for me, that has a, it's a little bit flat. Um, and this is what it looks like now. So I just, all in all, like the movement that this has created. We can go ahead and have a look and see what it looks like in the black. Yes, and I believe that we are good to go. I'll get this to my printer and, uh, and she'll, she will uh, change it up and uh, probably, make it, probably make it a lot better than I could and, uh, and we'll be good to go for the next show. In case you were curious, this is how the image turned out. It was shot to be part of a diptych and is part of a long-standing and long-going series I started in 1996 on etymology. But that's a story for another day. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something that I used in film photography and carried over into digital, and that's the use of filters. While I know most digital cameras have the ability to do all sorts of effects, such as add filters, in case yours doesn't, or in case you just want to experiment the old-fashioned way, try giving them a try. I always use a red filter when I need to photograph a landscape. Remember, in black and white photography, a color filter will render its own color as a lighter gray while darkening its opposite color. Think complementary colors. Now, a deep red filter allows red and blocks bluish colors. That gives you skies that are much darker gray and sometimes even almost black and really brings out those bright white fluffy clouds. A green filter, on the other hand, will lighten greens while absorbing reds, rendering those darker. Now, of course, all this can be done in Photoshop too, but some of the, some of the stuff done manually can really help you create a deeper understanding of how things work instead of just having a, a rather superficial knowledge. I'm going to bring this video to a close now. As always, I'd love to hear your comments in the Facebook group, and if you have any questions or want to post some work for me to have a look at, I'd love to see what you guys are doing. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you in the next video.